Well, good morning, my friends, and welcome to the Back Shed Bible Study. It is Monday, June, June 29th, 2020. It is, it is hard for me to believe that uh, it's almost July. I mean, growing up, July has always been my favorite, uh, absolute favorite month of the year. And that was when I was a kid because that was when I, it was my birthday month. So, you know, coming up in a couple of weeks, um, I get my birthday to celebrate here. And uh, I want to say a big morning to Cam Smith. Hi, Cam. Good to see you, my friend. God is good. Good morning, Wayne Lord. Good morning, uh, Randy Terry Pels. Good to have you all on here this morning. It is a blustery day in Fair Oaks today. The wind is blowing a couple of minutes ago. As I was getting ready for our time together, uh, I heard all kinds of commotion in the backyard over here and looked over and our, um, our oh gosh, our back table has a big umbrella and it totally did the Mary Poppins thing and uh, started go going across the yard. So had to run over and deal with that. But uh, I love, you're, you're not supposed to talk about the weather in these things, but I love the cooler weather that we're having uh, this week. And it's a, uh, a chance for me to actually work in the shed and not feel like uh, I'm, you know, in some major weight loss reduction uh, thing going on here. So, uh, no, Cam, I'm not at church. I'm in the shed. On uh, Wednesday, when we do Pastors Live, uh, I try to do that from the amazing air-conditioned office that I have. But because this is the back shed Bible study, I thought it's important to kind of try to keep this in the shed. The shed is a, is a bit of a mess right now, if you want to know the truth. And the reason being, as many of you know, we are in the middle of a major, uh, I, I would describe it as major kitchen remodel. When you tear everything out and go down to the studs, I call that a major kitchen remodel. And, and so the shed is a mess. We have, uh, I'll just let you guys in on some of the mess that is back here. Um, you can see that I got my um, reciproc I think it's called a reciprocating saw. We call it Sawzall is the brand, but this is a DeWalt. So that's, uh, that's going on there. We got some uh, plumbing that's getting ready to go in under the sink, hopefully next week. So I'm excited about that. And you didn't, for anyone that understands plumbing, you did not see this, just so you know. Um, and I got some electrical, electrical plugs, 20 amp circuit electrical plugs plugs and uh so that's going on good morning sharon good to see you good to see you yesterday loved your face mask that was that was good that's a good way to have good vision and uh um and so on she had the kind of full face uh mask going on uh, clear mask so anyway those are the things going on as we're doing this crazy kitchen remodel here at our house this month and uh, but we got the most amazing news this morning, and that is that uh, we've been stalled for about a week in in the whole process, as my friend Luke would say. Good morning, Tracy Kopshai. Good morning, Valerie. And um, Amazon. Sharon, why are you saying Amazon? Um, anyway, uh, we've we've been uh, we've been stopped several times. Or we've been we've been. Uh, slowed down in this whole process and uh, stalled, dare I say. And we got word from the texturing guy that he is going to uh, do the texture on our ceilings and our walls starting tomorrow afternoon, which that is amazing because as soon as the texture is up, we get to put cabinets up and this project starts moving. So uh, very excited about that. And then we have the goal, it all has to be done in less than three weeks from today because that is the day the Carey family leaves on vacation. I'm not advertising that out on the internet. Just wait, wait a second, I just did. There will be people staying at our house so you can't break in. Well, you could, but they're very mean people. They, they would do you in. Uh, oh, you bought it from Amazon. Okay, that makes sense. Sorry. I'm 
So, uh, so anyway, that's the big thing going on in the Carey House today, and uh, big excitement as we're moving forward with this little uh, do-it-yourself with a little bit of help from some outsiders kitchen remodel thing going on. All right, well, I wanted to jump into something this morning because I thought it would be good in light of just where life is, um, not just in our church, but a, a lot of us. I've been talking to a lot of you uh, over the last few weeks, and um, here we are. We are 15. This is episode 15 of the Back Shed Bible Study. I almost said Back Street. Um, of the Backshed Bible Study, which means we've been doing this COVID thing for 16 weeks, and and people are weary, um, people are frustrated. You know, obviously the news says the number of cases are up, and I I talk to people that are just going, I don't know if I believe all this. They're not looking at all the statistics correctly. Um, you know, where, where are the number of deaths and, and, and there's just all kinds of things going on where people are questioning, uh, what's happening. And, and I think some, some people are saying, well, maybe it's the beginning of the end. Maybe we're heading into end times. Uh, some people are saying, well, this is, this is the kind of thing, um, that just happens. And, and we in the church have an opportunity to, uh, to be light and to be an example to the world and, and others. And rather than um, having the church be one that's, that's standing up there uh, for our rights, that the uh, church instead should be uh, out there standing up for and defending um, the people that are weak and, and need help and, and uh, the defenseless, so to speak. So there are lots of perspectives on on where things are going right now. And I've got my own, of course, we all do. Uh, we all have our own biases along the way. But I had a, a just a phenomenal conversation last night with a good friend of mine, Josh Tapp. A lot of you know Josh Tapp in our church. And a little bit of a shout out to Josh because he helped me um, just keep my thinking straight in this. Because when when I look at everything that's going on in the world right now, uh, you know, I, I put it through the the lens of a of a Christian worldview, and and the lens of of how I was raised as well, and and the things that I have had as fundamental beliefs growing up, and you know, and those are things that are important and the, and that matter, but uh, but it is it is so important to keep things um, completely. Um, grounded in the word of God, not just in the tradition in which I've grown up, which sometimes blurs a lot. I don't, I don't know if you guys are like me, but uh, we, we very easily can, can say, you know, this, even, even our politics uh, that are framed by our Christian worldview, uh, sometimes our our politics are the things that are framing our Christian world, worldview if we're not too careful. I mean, if we're uh, uh, not careful enough. So uh, there's, there's a lot that just gets mixed up in this. And so I want to go back in the word uh, to the book of Mark today. And so if you, you have your Bibles with you and you're joining along, open up to the book of Mark. And we're going to dig into the word. And, and this is based upon a sermon uh, that I delivered about two years ago now, back in July. And, and to just frame it where the church was at the time, we had uh, been about a month without a senior pastor. And we were beginning on this journey of figuring out who we were as a church. And, and our team uh, at the church, we just kept hearing the word surrender show up, the word surrender. And, and any of you that were around back then, uh, I think you remember this, that, that this word surrender just kept coming up over and over and over. And, and it felt like God was speaking this word to our church um, through 
uh, through the scriptures and, and through a lot. And so we went into a, a six-week series that summer uh, that concluded in August uh, all around the word, the simple word, surrender. And so I want to take you back uh, to a moment that was in Mark chapter 5. And, and in this moment, and, and I'm going to be like, I actually went back and found my old sermon slides from then. And, and, uh, and while we're jumping into this, we're going to say, good morning, Lynette. Good morning, David. Uh, good to have you all on board here with us this morning. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump back. And, and we're in this point where Jesus is with his disciples. He has calmed a storm out on the Sea of Galilee. And people are, uh, people are, the, the disciples are looking at this man going, who is he? That, that, that the winds and the seas obey this man. Who, who is he? You know, we, th we thought we kind of knew who he was and he was this great teacher, but truly who is this guy? I mean, he has power. And, uh, and so he's, he, he's in the boats, gets his disciples in the boat and says, let's, let's go over to the other side. Uh, good morning, Donna. How are you, my friend? I missed you yesterday. Uh, and, uh, and so Jesus says, uh, get in the other side. So I'm going to share my screen here with you for a second and, and show you. Uh, this, is, this is a boat. You can see this thing over in uh, Israel. And, and this is a boat that uh, they, they call this the Jesus boat. Uh, and it's in, it's in a little kind of museum area there, uh, just off the Sea of Galilee. And, uh, and so the, the disciples get in the boat and, and they start heading over uh, to the other side of the lake, uh, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And, and so they're, they're kind of going along and, and they're heading over uh, from the, I'm going to try to find another slide. Here we go. This is a good one for you. Uh, and so they're heading over, they've, they've been over here, uh, kind of near Capernaum and all that, and they're heading over across, and you can see where the red arrow goes, uh, to this other side of the Sea of Galilee. And this is, uh, let's see, what do we have written here next? I want to uh, so let's, yeah, here we can read this together. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet, with, meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out, and cut himself with stones. And, and so that is, uh, that's who we're talking about right now. And uh, I'm, I'm pulling up my notes here because it, it, this just gets so fun as we go through here. So I want to uh, uh, set a little context uh, for him. <sighs> As they're going over to the other side, they're not going over to an area where uh, the, the Jews would be hanging out, okay? So for his disciples, right now, it's, it's getting ready to get a little scary because um, first off, they've been through this, this weird, crazy thing on the lake with the storm. And then Jesus says, all right, everybody get back in the boat and we're going over to the other side. And they're like, wait a second, mom and dad told me I'm not allowed to hang out over on the other side, over there on the east side. Uh, that's, that's, not, that's not where I belong. Um, there aren't people like me over there. Are you picking that up? The, the people that live over there, they, they aren't like me. And, and they're greeted the moment they get out of the boat, they're, they're greeted by this demon-possessed man, okay? And, and, and most of us know the story because in, in this story, this, this, this Jesus cast the demon out of this man and, um, and, uh, da, 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 da. oh gosh. Yeah. Jesus cast the demon out of this man into this herd of pigs. The herd of pigs runs down the side of the mountain into the sea and, and is completely, you know, eliminated. 
and people are like, dude, get out of here. We, we don't need your likes around here. First off, we've never seen that kind of power. And second off, you, you have just destroyed an economic uh, part of our, uh, or you know, you've just destroyed, destroyed a part of our economy. Uh, we, we don't need your likes around here. And, uh, and so they're kind of standing by the Sea of Galilee there waiting, trying to, to figure out what to do next. And, and you see this here and as we move to verse 18. And so they're getting ready to get back into the boat. And the man who had been demon possessed begs to go with him. You know, so this man has been freed up, but Jesus didn't let him. He says, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And, and that part is really important to me because I think so many times one of the things that we want to do as people that are, have been saved by Jesus is we want to then go into the safe spot with Jesus. We, we want to be in his physical presence all the time, and we want to be around other believers all the time and be in that safe spot. And, and Jesus looks at this man and goes, no, sorry, dude, you, you don't get to come with me. Uh, in fact, I would, I would like you to stay in, in this world where you have lived and, and to be a, a living testimony in this world that you're, you're not going to go, go hide and hang out with, with us, with the Christians over here. You're and they're not even called Christians yet at this point, but you're, you're going to go back amongst your people and, and, and tell them the good news. And, and which is an amazing thing because we, we find out that this man does that exact thing. He goes back and tells everybody and people are like, wasn't that the guy that was just running around naked in the tombs and all that? And wow, you know, Big story. So um, pretty, really, really cool thing happening there. And so we move on a little bit and, uh, and we're going to go down here uh, a little bit. Oh yeah, this is going to get good, you guys. So this is, this is an important part, another little, uh, little share here. And so the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. And so he heads into the Decapolis. And a lot of people are like, well, what's the Decapolis? And, and if I can, can show you on the map here, the Decapolis is this whole area that is, is kind of on you know, the southeastern part of the Sea of Galilee and all these towns. And down here, uh, a little more to the south, is this, this town called Scatopolis. Today it's called Bet Cheyenne. And hey, look at that. I click it and it all comes to life there. I forgot I had made these slides there two years ago. And so this is, this is the Decapolis. And this is where the guy is from. And this is where he's going to tell the story. This is a, a, a modern day picture that I took at a place called Bet Cheyan uh, at, at Scatopolis, which would have been the, the capital there. 80,000 people. It's a center of culture, crossroads of trade. Um, this is, these are the ruins. This is a massive, absolutely massive city. As you look down, uh, even just at the Colosseum area, not Colosseum, but at the, the theater, um, and so on. And so, um, there, there are a lot of things we learn here from the demon possessed man. And, uh, I, uh, we're going to, we're going to get back to a few of these slides later, but I, I say, the first is Jesus takes his disciples to places that feel dangerous. Okay, get that. Jesus takes his disciples to places that feel dangerous. And, and the second thing that we learn from Mark 5 and this, this demon-possessed man is that because they went to, the, to a dangerous place, the name of Jesus spread in a region where it normally would not have spread. And, and I think that's something that's, that's a, a, a challenge to a lot of us is, I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I just don't want to go to dangerous places. I would rather stay 
in my shed with my power tools here, um, which could be dangerous depending on how you look at it. But you know, I'd, I'd rather hang out. I'd rather hang out at sunrise, you know, in in our with our comfortable group of of Christian friends, than get out there and and even talk with people that are not in the same world that I'm normally in. And, and I think that's just a, a natural temptation for everybody, no matter where people are. People do not automatically just want to go to uncomfortable situations and place themselves in uncomfortable situations. People want to go where it's safe and where it's secure. And you've heard that adage that a ship and a harbor is safe and secure, but that's not what ships are built for. Um, I, I, I think that's so true. The, but the, the thing we learn in this is that Jesus always kind of takes them to a dangerous place and then he brings them back. And, and they probably kind of regroup a little bit. My guess is, is maybe they talked a little bit more about some of the things that, that had happened with that uh, demon-possessed man and, and, and what he had done. Uh, and, and how God was using him. And, and I'm sure they asked, well, come on, Jesus, why, why couldn't you have brought him? We could have told so many people. He could have testified to so many people about you. And Jesus is like, but that's not what I called him to. I called him to go back to his people, to the people that, that would listen to his voice and maybe not listen to the rest of our voices. Um, kind of an interesting thought, right? Well, we find again in Jesus's character that uh, he is going to take them to a dangerous place yet again. So let's skip ahead. We're going to go to Mark chapter eight uh, for the rest of this. And this is kind of towards the end of the chapter. And I'm going to see if I can find my way here to the slide we're going to go to in Mark chapter eight, verse 27. And and here's where it starts. I, uh, uh, it's just the simple verse. It says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. So, okay, I, I don't know about you. Uh, it's, uh, let's, let's get clear view back again so I can see you for a second. I don't know about you, but I've read Mark 8 so many times. And, and I've read this whole thing about Caesarea Philippi so many times, and I skipped right over it. Um, I, I just skipped right past it because it, it was like, okay, so we went to Caesarea Philippi, whatever. Um, Randy is saying right here, that's where the neighborhood welcome ministry comes in, going out from sunrise to seemingly risky places. Right, Randy? Exactly. Exactly. That, that, and, and I like that you use the word seemingly. Like, how hard is neighborhood visitation? You know, like you're going to go talk to people that live in our neighborhoods, right? But for some of us, that's a foreign world. Like we, we have, some of us have isolated ourselves into a, a purely Christian safe world. Um, David, even talking about prisons that were to go to prisons, you're doing that exact thing right now. Um, yeah, so, so Jesus takes them now to Caesarea Philippi. And, and again, I've read this, this verse over and over, and, and I looked at it, and Caesarea Philippi, sure, whatever. But again, if you look at it on the map and, and know the context, this is a little bit different. So we've been down here at the Sea of Galilee. All of this took place down here. Now Jesus takes them way up here to Caesarea Philippi. Well, the thing that's important to understand about Caesarea Philippi is, first off, it is gorgeous. Like, it is just beautiful um, uh, water running through here, green. Uh, it's just a, a neat spot. And, and there at Caesarea Philippi is this, you, you come upon this giant rock face right there. And as you get a little bit closer... Um, you, you see this cave of sorts uh, that is right there. And so let me read as you kind of look at this um, uh, verse. Actually, I'm going to come back to, to the pretty part, and then we'll get to that. 
It says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And this is where he says to them, on the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? And they reply, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. And, uh, but what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And Jesus said, don't Jesus warn them not to tell anyone about him. Okay. So now, now that we read that, I, uh, we're going to, we're going to stop this right here for a second because, uh, what we, what we miss in this, and especially if you just read this in the gospel of Mark, you, you miss a whole bunch of context of what's getting ready to happen, uh, here, but, uh, we're the okay yeah sorry you guys just be patient with me here is here is what's going on at Caesarea Philippi this is the place where where the the god pan is is worshiped the sanctuary of pan is set up here and so you can you can see in these places there where there's this kind of hole in the rock there I believe over on the, the left side, and this is, this is probably um, the spot where I showed you right there that that cave goes down here. And, and this is what they literally called the gates of Hades, okay? And so it's uh, Pan is the Greek god of goat herders. It's believed that the water that came up out of this cave is coming from the underworld, um, and, and what happens here at this spot is pan worship. And, and that can just consist of these awful, unspeakable, debaucherous acts. And, and they're the kind of things that, that you would rarely even see in today's culture. Uh, that's what's going on at Caesarea Philippi. And, and so it's, it's kind of important to stop when you when you even read this in mark 8 and he he starts taking his disciples up here it was bad enough when he took them across the galilee to the region of the garrisons now he's taking them to caesarea philippi and it's like hey um my parents didn't sign a, a release for me to go to this place like this is bad stuff that is happening up there these are things that i should not, cannot. Uh, I've been told only about. Um, I, I shouldn't be exposed to these kinds of things that are happening. Uh, I need to run as fast as I can away from this. And 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 I can't think of a better example than what we're the the kind of culture that we're living in today, where we are incredibly um, anxious about the things that our culture is doing. Uh, we are incredibly, uh, some of us are incredibly afraid uh, by the things that our, our kids will get exposed to in this culture today. I mean, it's, it's kind of a scary world out there. And I mean, I struggle with it myself. I, I am very intentional about sending my kids, April and I are very intentional about sending our kids uh, to a Christian school. Um, and, and a lot of that has to do with exposure and, and having them exposed to things um, at certain ages that, that we just don't think is appropriate you know, for an eight-year-old to be exposed to certain things. And, and that's part of why we choose to send our kids to a Christian school um, and, and make some of the sacrifices to, to be able to make that happen. But, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a tough balance there because at the same time, if I just hide them and isolate them from all the junk that's out there in the world. And then suddenly one day they, they grow up and they're an adult and there's the world, you know, what do they do with that? And, and it's a kind of a, a comical but not comical story is just on uh, Friday, I took my two younger ones over to the Bay Area uh, because we needed to pick up some uh, kitchen cabinets that happened to be over there that we couldn't get over here. 
and and the day took a long time and we we just we drove all over the bridges we went across the golden gate the richmond bridge we went across uh bay bridge so you know for a six-year-old and eight-year-old they were in heaven they just thought it was the coolest day ever and um but i <laughs> titus my eight-year-old he's like daddy what are all these rainbow flags that are everywhere and uh and then he just stops and goes is that the flag of this city and i go yeah we're kind of kind of yeah like and 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 frankly i just wasn't ready to have that conversation with an eight-year-old and and i think that's fine you know with a 10 12 year old yeah i'd probably need to be having that conversation but at that point you know again that level of exposure and and you know judge me all you want that's fine but that's that's we're 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 trying to figure out that balance, right? I think all of us as parents are trying to figure out that balance of of what is a, a proper level of exposure to the things that are out there in the world for us. But the the caution part for all of us here is as Christians, sometimes we mistake um, exposure for temptation. And, and so we see the stuff in the world and we go, okay, I've got to run as far as I can away from that because um, I don't want to be exposed to it. And God is saying, right there in the middle of all that sin are the people that desperately need me the most. So, I, and, I, and I believe God's saying this, stop running away from it. Stop running away from it. And, and, and so as I look at, what happened at Caesarea Philippi, um, it, it's necessary to go back to Matthew chapter 16 uh, because we get the rest of what Jesus said uh, to Peter, okay? And so Matthew 16, verses 17 and 18. So this fills in the blanks that, that Mark leaves in his gospel. And part of this is Mark is writing uh to people that not all the information is necessary and that uh that matthew had included and so verse 17 blessed are you simon simon son of jonah for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood but by my father in heaven and i tell you that you are peter and on this rock i will build my church and the gates of hades will not overcome it Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. I tell you that you're Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it, okay? So remember, uh, let's see here. Oh, goodness gracious. We're going we're gonna to go back. I got to find, find the slide here, okay? So, so let's go back to the gates of Hades right here. And, and these good little Jewish boys that are uh, hanging out with Jesus and getting exposed to all the junk at this time are looking at this place and they're looking at the, the worship of the Greek god Pan and, and how disgusting and, and everything is that are, that's going on and, and the waters of the underworld that are coming up and flowing out of this cave. And Jesus is saying, I am going to establish my church and this will not prevail against it. You get that? I am going to establish my church and, and all that junk that the world has to offer is not going to prevail against it. So again, Jesus was not afraid to take his disciples to dangerous places at all. In and if anything, he, he wanted those young men to get there and to see how bad it was to see how strong he was as Jesus. Okay. And Jesus goes on to say, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he orders his disciples not to tell them that he was the, uh, the Messiah. So two takeaways from this. Number one, Jesus will always take us to dangerous places. If, if we are a disciple, if we are a true disciple of Jesus, 
he is going to take us to dangerous places. Second takeaway uh, from this, God's church can withstand whatever the world throws at it, right? God's church is going to withstand whatever the world throws at it, okay? Whatever the world throws at it. God's church can handle COVID, okay? God's church can handle the racial divide from this country that, that, is, that is just destroying our nation right now. God's church can handle that because we're, we're talking about dealing with the God of the universe. We're talking about the, the person who is on our side is, has, has complete control, is completely sovereign, and is completely powerful. And, and no matter what the world throws at it, God's church will prevail because it's his church, okay? And, I, and I'm not even just, ta- I'm not talking about sunrise here. I'm talking about God's church, okay? Big C, church. Uh, so before we kind of close it, let me run back to a couple of uh, comments. Bravo to Christian schools. Thank you, Sharon. Um, um, I, I love our, our little Christian school. I love it so much that they put me on the board. And then at the third board meeting I went to, they said, uh, we need a new chairman of the board. Uh, one, two, three, not it. And everyone raised their hand. And suddenly I'm like, okay, I guess I'm the chairman. Anyway, uh, so about the last uh, three years, I've had the privilege of being the chairman of the school board over at Summit Christian School. And I absolutely adore this school. And I love uh, what it's doing for our kids. I'm going to, um, sometime in the next few weeks, I'm excited to uh, bring uh, on the Backshed Bible Study, uh, Peggy Johnson, who is our middle school. She's a Bible teacher. Um, she teaches Bible, math, science, loves science, and she has had a profound impact on our middle school students over at the school. So she is it's scheduled to be a potential guest. So super excited to have her coming. Um, and uh, yeah, David, I agree. What a wonderful partnership could be achieved between a church and a Christian school working together. And, 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 and this is key. Like to me, I, I look at this and say, and sorry for getting distracted off of uh, what, what our scripture is in Mark and Matthew, but uh, I think a, a church can invest into a Christian school in such a way that we are uh, making disciples. Like it, it's a great venue, avenue for uh, for making disciples and preparing kids to be salt and light in a world that desperately needs salt and light. You know, I, I think, um, I think something that, uh, an, an old friend of mine mentioned to me about five years ago, he says, Cliff, I, I think the church today is a lot more like Babylon than it is in there the, that our situation today is a lot more like Babylon, the Babylonian exile than it is of the time of the church of acts and and i think that's really true it's in in so many ways um we're uh, going into exile of sorts and and here you you have daniel and shadrach meshach and Abednego, you know in babylon and and they're figuring out how to live and work and be a part of a foreign culture with its foreign gods and foreign languages and all of that. And these guys, I mean, this is a whole nother study for another day, but these guys learned how to adapt and, and function in that culture. And it went right up to a certain point and then they stop and say, but this is, these are, these are the no goes, you know? And, and, and I think that's something we have to do as followers of Christ in today's culture is, is we have to learn how to, to live in, in, this margin that's kind of in the middle, but then we say, all right, but this is it. This is, this is where we're, we're not entering, uh, you know, and for, for Daniel and his boys, that was eating meat and, and, uh, and a few other things and had to do with prayer and false gods and, and so on. But uh, God obviously took care of them. I mean, the guys ate vegetables and they still grew strong. Um, okay. But uh, returning to that, to, to, kind of close things up in our conversation here is that uh, God takes us to dangerous places and, and he gives us his Holy Spirit uh, to, to work. And so how is uh, God calling us 
to uh, to function in a uh, in a world that is like just doing all of these crazy things. Um, I think that God is calling us to be his ambassadors, uh, that he is giving us his Holy Spirit to be his voice, you know? So, so Jesus says, I'm leaving, but I'm, I'm going to leave behind this part of me, so to speak. And, and they don't understand at the time, but he says, oh, I'm leaving the earth, but I'm, I'm leaving you behind. You're going to be my ambassadors and, and I'm going to give you the comforter. He's going to come and he's going to fill you. And, and, and that is how you are going to speak my words and you are going to be my salt and light because you're going to be filled with my Holy Spirit. He's not telling them this literally, but we find out later in the book of Acts, like, oh, I get it. You're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and, and therefore we get to be his ambassadors um, to, to live for him in the midst of this culture. So, um, so that's, that's it, you know, so, so when we talked about surrender, uh, two years ago, the, the big part of this was I, I want to give up. I want to surrender my right to be comfortable. I want to, I need to surrender some of my idols. Um, comfort is an idol. My kitchen can be my idol. Um, even my kids, there are, there are a lot of things that have can become idolatrous and I have to surrender those things and submit myself to Christ and trust that he is going to, to carry me and give me the strength and, and to walk me through this dangerous world. And I can't be afraid of the, the other stuff that's out there. I can't be afraid of what the world is throwing at us. Uh, let me throw at you a, um, this was a, uh, a something that I, I looked at a couple of years ago and, and it is, oh, where is it? Okay, here we go. One more thing. This was a, a slide that I put on the screen when, when I was given this message a couple of years ago, uh, but it was uh, 10 things that were common in churches that had closed their doors. And this was from a book called Aut Autopsy of a Deceased Church by Tom Rainer. Uh, if you don't know who Tom Rainer is, he was head of the Southern Baptist Convention, and he's done a lot of church consulting and so on. But, but they did research, and they identified 10 different things that were common in churches that had had to close their doors. Um, and, and they were slow erosion. Things were just you know, glad, slowly eroding away. They were uh, the past is the hero, where a church looked at its past and its reputation and the things uh, that it had been so successful at in the past. And, and celebrated the past rather than looked forward towards the future and what God had called them to. Um, this, is, uh, this one is brutal. Uh, refusing to look like the community. A church died because the community around it changed and the church refused to change with it. Um, I knew a church down in Southern California that struggled with this exact thing. Um, the, it's an old, old church, about, they're probably a hundred years old today. And as the community grew increasingly Hispanic around it, it, it was a very white church. It just did not reflect its neighborhood. And so it became irrelevant in its neighborhood. This church chose to, uh, inject themselves into the neighborhood and, and did a major course change and, and became like their neighborhood. But what it meant for them was they hired a a Spanish-speaking Hispanic man to, to, to be their youth pastor. And, and it just foundationally changed. But it was uncomfortable and it was dangerous. Um, anyway, the other things you can see in them, budgets start to become more inward than outward. The Great Commission becomes the Great Omission. Um, church is driven by preferences rather than by mission. I, I think we can struggle with that at sunrise a lot. Um, you know, I, I need to look you in the face when I say this. Um, I mean, how many times have we struggled with the styles of worship? And is it the first service style? Is it the second service style? Is it something else? Is it, you know, how, in, and even in relaunch, a lot of people have struggled with how relaunch is happening and how we should be doing that. So there's, there's just a lot of stuff where we look at our own preferences and like, this is my church and my church should be my way, you know? And, and we have to, we, let me look you in the face. We have to repent of that one. Like, 
I, I have to repent of the my church attitude. Um, that is, it gets, it gets us nowhere. It drives the church into the ground and nobody wants to come in to a church that belongs to someone else, right? People want to come into a church that's following Christ. That's it's his church, not mine. Ugh. Okay. Um, uh, we had talked about, where were the other ones? Pastoral tenure declines. The church rarely prays together. Randy, I expect you to drop a note on this one. Uh, are we praying together? Are we getting together to pray for not just each other, but pray for the things that, uh, that God would, would have for us? Where we, are we praying for our community? You know, do we pray for Fair Oaks and Orangevale and Citrus Heights? Do we pray for Rancho? Do we pray for, you know, what God's doing in, in our area? Um, how are we doing in prayer in our church? I, I get convicted by that. The church, uh, let's see here, the ninth, church has no clear purpose. Uh, and then the 10th, the church that obsesses over facilities. And um, boy, I, I sure want to be cautious when, when we look at, at how a church moves forward uh, that we're not resting uh, in any of these areas. I know that these are uh, that we're not obsessing about facilities, that that we don't lack purpose, and and so on. And uh, so, boy, you know, my invitation. I, I think sometimes we just got to go back and and remember a little bit. But my invitation to you today, to me, is we we've got to be wholeheartedly surrendered to Christ and and just ready to pivot, to go wherever He's calling us to go, to do whatever He's calling us to do. Uh, to not be afraid of the world that, that he's calling us to navigate through because, that, because he has sent us his comforter. That's where our comfort comes. It's not from living in our comfortable house in Fair Oaks. He's giving us his comforter, his Holy Spirit. That's where our safety comes. That's where our security comes from the Holy Spirit being in us, right? Oh, man. Anyway, so there we go this morning. Um, as we as we kind of wrap things up <sighs> seriously any any other comments here i'm i'm not seeing a lot but uh um, you all have been a lot of fun to be with this morning um, i'm excited next week next monday uh, i'm excited to bring on board the backshed bible study we're back to having some guests and steve heller is going to be uh, joining us. And Steve is an old friend of Sunrises and has been a, a huge part in our annual men's retreat that we go to, uh, Men in HD as it's called. And so Steve's going to be uh, joining us. We're going to talk about how God's been moving a little bit in Men in HD. And then he and I are going to uh, bust into a Bible study on David. So uh, get your get your Old Testament out and get ready to have some fun uh, with David. That's going to be next week. Um, Valerie, you say um, not an easy task. You know exactly, right? Ah, not an easy task at all. And um, I, I completely agree. And so much in me just wants to be that ship in the harbor that just goes and rests. I just get tired. Uh, I, I don't want to live in the hard. And, and yet I know very clearly God's called me to, to go through the hard. Like that's just, that's what we go through. It stinks. Um, Sharon says, so many of us old timers are so set in our ways. We're prayerfully trying to keep moving forward. I, and I want to say I know, but I don't, you know, like I've, I'm, I'm in midlife. Okay. I turned 51 in a couple of weeks, but, um, but it's, it's, I, I realize that, uh, that it's really hard, you know, and, and so much there, there's a lot to be said for just being in stability, being in a, a world where you're, you're just not having to, to worry about things and, and wading into those dangerous waters. And, um, uh, and so that's part of that, you know, just utter dependence upon the Holy Spirit, even depending upon the Holy Spirit to guide us into and through these dangerous waters and not to just go, okay, I'm just going to go out there and jump into the dangerous waters. And if we do that without the power of the Holy Spirit, without um, him leading us, then obviously we're, we're going at it the wrong way. We're just diving in 
um, for the sake of diving in. In fact, this, this leads me to, um, I got one more screen share. I think I can pull this up for you. Um, this leads me into a, a thing I saw last night that, that really stood out to me. And I, and I think you guys will like this. Let's see if I can pull this off um, on how to screen share this thing. Uh, because what this talks about has to do with, uh, where is it? There we go. Let's see here. I'm going to do that. And no, I don't need that. A plugin is required. I don't, I shouldn't need a plugin. Okay. And on your, okay. There we go. All right. And then we're going to mirror this thing. Here we go. Ready? So this right here is on my phone. And, uh, but this is a, a quote I came across uh, last night. And Scott Sauls is, is a pastor that I, I follow him on social media. But look at this. Social justice without Jesus can be more Darwinian than just. Fighting against unjust power only to assume and assert unjust power. Social justice with Jesus is truly just. It seeks not to assert power, but to sacrificially use power to love your neighbor as yourself. Boy, isn't that good? Yeah, that social justice with Jesus is just. You know, it's truly just. It doesn't assert power. It sacrificially uses power to love your neighbor. And, and that's that, that power that only comes uh, through, uh, you see, I was texting Josh Tapp. I did her. I better un, unmirror that. I don't want y'all to see Josh. Um, anyway, so I, I, I loved that one. That was, that was so powerful to me because it, it, it just says you, you don't go and do all this on your own strength. And when we do do it on our own strength, we totally botch it up. We totally go the wrong direction. And so we have to do it in the strength of Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how we do it. All right. Um, you guys, comments have been fantastic today. Thank you so much. God does uneasy really well, David. You are absolutely right. God does uneasy incredibly well. And so I'd rather have him doing it than me doing it. So if he's the one that leads me and walks with me and holds me through that, um, that's the way to do it. Hey, let's pray. And we're going to close things up for the day. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we're going to get on our way. Father, thank you for uh, your word. Thank you for places like uh, the Gerasenes, the region of the Gerasenes. Um, thank you for Caesarea Philippi and those places you took your disciples that they did not want to go. And yet you gave them the strength and the power as you went there uh, and took them there and guided them through it. And I pray that we would learn how to um, handle dangerous places as we're uh, navigating this world uh, through your power. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all, I appreciate you. It's good being here with you this morning again. Hope you're able to join us again next week on Monday at 10 o'clock as uh, we welcome our, uh, our old friend that's going to come <laughs> talk to us. Oh, my goodness. I, uh, Steve, that's his name. Golly, Steve Heller. I've botched his name there for a second. So Steve Heller will be back with us on the Backshed Bible Study. Like I said, taking us into David, talking about men in HD. It'll be a fun morning. Uh, love you all, and we will see you next week.